Game Time with Boomer Esiason. This week's guest was named Olympic Athlete of the Century by the International Olympic Committee, Carl Lewis. Presented by GEICO. In the early 1990s, the Houston Chronicle called today's outspoken guest the most uncompromising athlete of his time. He was also the best athlete of his time, if you ask me, a record-breaking long jumper and sprinter who captured nine gold medals for the U.S. over four Olympics, including four in 1984, to equal Jesse Owens' historic 1936 performance in Berlin. Today, he coaches track at his alma mater, the University of Houston. It is my pleasure to welcome in one of my favorite people, the legendary Carl Lewis. Carl, great to see you, man, and welcome to Game Time. Great. Thank you, Boomer. Good, great seeing you. You know, we, we've been around together a long time. <laughs> yes, we have. You're a little bit faster than I am, though, I will tell you that. Let's get, let's get into what's going on in Houston these days. I know it's a hot spot for the pandemic and everything else. You guys have 15 athletes, I believe, that are hoping to make it to the 2021 Olympics now that it's been moved mm -hmm. uh, from 2020. Give me the assessment of your program, the city of Houston, and everything that's going on down there right now. In terms of our program, we're, we're stacked. I mean, our sprint program is bringing our seniors back. So we, without question, have more speed than any team has in history. I'm really excited about that. Um, and as an overall team, we're back in the national championship talk. Houston is, as you know, is a big sports city. Uh, I think it's probably the best track and field city in the whole world for high school. So I've got all these great kids to stay. And we've convinced them that you don't have to go to a power five school. You can stay here at Ace Town Speed City and get what you want to do. So with all of that, I'm excited about what you mentioned, the, the probably 15 athletes that will be at the Olympics. You're working with your former teammate rival Leroy Burrell down there, and I can't imagine that it would be all that difficult for you guys to walk into somebody's house and recruit them to come to the University of Houston, given all your backgrounds and all your success. You know, I go out and recruit uh, by myself without Leroy because I'm a lot more vocal than Leroy is. You know, <laughs> he, he, we're we're kind of like the, you know, the good cop, bad cop guy. And most of the time I'm the bad cop. So um, he, he was, when I did it, I, I, I just appealed to their emotion. Because it, the thing is, is that college to me is, is really about kids going to school to, to earn a degree to, to make money. And they want to become professional athletes. They want to become um, Olympians. So really, it's, it's just getting there and saying, look, I was where you were. I've been through the whole process and I know how to get you there. So it's not about the university. It's not about the city. It's about you. When you think about all you've accomplished in your career, what you're doing now, uh, from where you came from, it, it seems like there's a drive within an Olympian athlete that only a few people in this world have. Is that true? Yeah, it is. I mean, the thing about it is that most Olympic sports, um, it is a singular drive because you have to, if you look at, uh, you have team sports like basketball and baseball, these, but most of them are swimming and, and, you know, and winter skiing and track and field and all these sports that are individualized. For me, um, my parents were teachers, the track coaches uh, in the community. So I think one of the great things that I did uh, or was able to experience is not only their support, but also them coaching an entire team of 200 kids. So they couldn't like dawdle on me 100%. Now they never missed a race. I'd say, gosh, you didn't see me run. And mom's like, you didn't get out of the blocks, you know? <laughs> but but it, I had to share them with the community. And I think that was something that was a good lesson for me as a young kid, that um, they were always there, always supportive. For me, it really taught me about winning and losing and the values and how people that are losing feel and then later when I started winning, I understood that. Even before he was an Olympian, Carl Lewis was making his mark for Houston coach Tom Telez by breaking records at NCAA, national and international competitions all over the place. For instance, he'd write in his 1990 memoir, Inside Track, that the first track and field world championships that were held in Helsinki back in 1983 was one of the best meets of my entire career. Your mom was supposed to be in the Olympics in Helsinki in 1952, and unfortunately she got hurt and she didn't play and she didn't get a chance to, to compete there. But here you are some 31 years later in that same stadium and your mom was in the stands. Yeah, that, that I tell you, Boomer, that was pretty emotional because you know we, di we didn't hear a lot of stories about my mother's career. She just didn't talk about it. And um, as we got older, we started reading things. You know, it's, we don't have the internet and things like that, as you remember. Um, and I said, well, wait a minute, what is this? And what are these shoes in the, in the attic for and these medals? What's going on? 
And so, so as time went on, we kind of heard the stories about her. And it was just ironic that she was doing a photo shoot for Life magazine and got injured and didn't get a chance to go to the Olympics in 52. And it's my first international competition um, for the United States was actually in Helsinki because I made the 80 Olympic team, but we boycotted. So to yeah. go to the world championships and she, I remember her getting it and I finally made it. <laughs> and, and I was able to win three gold medals and you're right. That was what launched it. And I think when I was able to do that, that's when everyone started thinking, my goodness, can he do this in 84? And that's when it all kicked off. You won the long jump. You set your first world record in the 100 meters in Helsinki. And I, I just kind of feel knowing you and, and being around you over the years and even talking to you today that you felt like there was even more that you could push for and that you were driving to become the greatest athlete of our time. Helsinki was so important because um, I, I, I won the 100, 200 long jump at the Nationals, but didn't compete in Helsinki in all four. And, and that was a meet that said, well, now that I'm on the big stage, I can do it. <clears throat> and so it, it basically supercharged my thoughts to try to go to tie Jesse Owens. And um, if Helsinki had been a silver here or the relay wasn't that good or maybe the long jump was tough, then it would, would have definitely hurt my confidence trying for that. So, yeah, it, it told me that you can do this. You, you don't know until you do it, as you, as you can imagine. But it told me you can do this for um, you have the ability. It just has to be calculated the right way. Now, before we get to 1984, you mentioned his name, Jesse Owens, uh, your idol. Uh, give me uh, just a, I guess, a brief synopsis of your feelings towards him and his accomplishments in Berlin. Jesse Owens was absolutely an amazing, uh, like you said, an idol for me. And what happened, I met him at a young age. My father was kind of there. It attracted me to introduce me to him. And it really opened my eyes to so many things. Number one, um, talking about civil rights, beating Hitler, World War II, all these things when I was reading about them uh, just came up and I never even thought about it. And so when I finally was able to um, get, get better and get up into 1980, because he passed away in 1980, it was just an amazing thing for me. He, he was a, a tremendous, uh, not only idol, but an influence in how I thought. Because when I got into track and field and started thinking about what I was going to do, a lot of the things that I learned from him affected how I thought. Really well said there, Carl. We'll be back with the one-time fastest man in the world right after this very quick break. The great Carl Lewis, stay with us. You're watching Game Time with Boomer Esiason. After the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, four-time gold medalist Carl Lewis told reporters that I had been misunderstood many times the last two weeks, just as I'd been so many times before. But that did nothing to erase the personal satisfaction and joys of achievement that I would take away from the games. This has been the time of my life. And I remember these Olympics because obviously of the boycott of the 1980s, uh, we were all looking forward to this. This was Peter Ubaros Olympics. This was going to be prime time. You were going to be the face of the Olympics and you performed. You actually lived up to what your dream ultimately was. Looking back on it, 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 it was tremendous. I mean, it started in the fall and then, of course, in the spring, starting in January, I was on the cover of a national magazine every day. You know, those days we didn't know a lot of what we know now. We didn't understand the media. Uh, Olympians didn't have publicists. Uh, we had just little uh, managers, not really agents. So there were so many things that we were learning on the fly. The coaching part was hard. The athletic part, did I race too much? Do I weigh too much? Did I do did I sleep enough? And then um, should I do this interview and miss practice? Should I skip? I mean, there were so many things happening. And, and then it just got to the point where I said, well, none of that has to matter. I've just got to put everything on the competition because that'll all go away. But if I don't win these medals, and, and do my best. That's something I'll have to live with. And, and it became so crazy that I remember a press conference just before the Olympics, a reporter said, um, well, you're, you're favorite for four. So what if you get three goals and a silver? And it was like, is it that crazy? <laughs> I mean, I've never been to the Olympics. You're saying, what if I only get three goals? So it was, it was, it was just madness. Even though it was a lot of challenges, I wouldn't change anything. I mean, it just helped make me who I am now. You actually got booed for not going after yeah. Bob Beeman's record. You decided right. to rest because you know that you were not going to be beaten in that particular event. So you had a rest for the other events and you decided that, you know what, we'll let the record stay where it is and I'm going to go after these gold medals. Uh, do you regret that decision to this day? 
I should have been very clear about, look, I'm only going to take one or two jumps. I'm not trying to break the world record. I, you know, because it, there was a commercial with Bob Beeman on there saying, go get them, kid. So, so I think that I could have done that differently. But if you really break it down, I, I competed in 11 races and um, two days of long jumping. So I ended up taking four jumps. So the, the final day of the long jump was the same day that I ran two 200 meters that morning. So looking back on it, what I would do differently is I would have made it much more clear what my intentions were in advance in, in, in hopes that the media projected that to the public so that they would have understood, you're right, my best event was the easiest event. So uh, rest on that one because I still had five races to go after that long jump. And you won the four gold medals. You know, the interesting thing for me also from that Olympics, and because it was such a big PR event, because the United States was backing it, there were flags everywhere, you win a race, a fan in the stands hands you an American flag, and you run around a victory lap with that flag. And it was like, all of a sudden, there was criticism following you. Like, that was planned, that was staged, and everything else. And then subsequently, later on, a newspaper did a whole investigation on this. And it was happenstance. It was yeah. a coincidence that you took the flag from the fan and ran around the track. I can see how people would say, you know what? He set that thing up. Um, but, but the vitriol of it didn't make sense to me. And, and so I, I, the way I look at all of this is that I see so many things like grabbing the flag. Um, you people that have done it before. George Foreman, we know the famous picture. Now everyone grabs the flag. Um, the clothing and the dressing and the hair and all that stuff. Well, everyone's like saying, what's this guy doing? Now everyone does that. So it, it, you know, someone had to take the fall. Uh, you know, at the time, it was very <laughs> difficult and challenging. But I look back on it with pride and saying, you know, I was really one of the first ones to actually go out and do those kind of things when you get to the point where I don't even take any pride in the flag or the country or the, or the letters on my chest, that, that was what became absurd to me. Yeah, it was absurd and I'm glad you did it and I'm glad that you did it and you did it uh, proudly because uh, for all of us who saw it, we loved it. All right, we'll continue in a moment with the man who won 65 consecutive long jumps over the span of a decade. Amazing, stay with us. You're watching Game Time with Boomer Esiason. The biggest track and field event at the 1988 Seoul Olympics was a showdown in the 100 meters between rivals Carl Lewis and Canadian Ben Johnson. Now, before the race, Lewis looked at Johnson and later said, I noticed that his eyes were very yellow, a sign of steroid use. Whoever told you about yellow eyes and steroids? I, I, I never had heard that before <laughs> until I read this. Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what happened is that we kind of knew about Ben and his group, his coach, for, for years. And there was always speculation. So you start reading about information about, well, what are the tell, tell, tell signs? And so some of it's jaundice, which is yellowing in the eyes and, of course, muscle, and then quick recovery. So that's really what happened. The reason we knew that is because we, we started looking for the signs uh, that showed steroids because we all, we all heard and were pretty clear that, that he and his group were taking it. Yeah, he won the gold medal, and then a couple days later, it was stripped. But you didn't get a chance to stand on the podium winning that gold medal. So, I, I mean, I guess you were vindicated with your comments, but at the end of the day, it's yeah. still not really being fulfilled the way you should have been fulfilled by receiving the gold medal. Yeah, it, it, it was interesting because it was, I think in a lot of ways, it was kind of an embarrassment a little bit, too, especially to uh, our track and field federation, because they everyone around was saying this and technically it, it appeared that they condoned it so when we did get the medal it was really interesting because it was kind of like in a uh, almost like a dungeon kind of place with system press and um you have to hand the medal back so actually i was getting the actual medal that was in ben's hand you know he had for a couple of days so uh, they're handing it to me and and i don't know why but when i got it and the first thing that popped in my head is i looked at the medal and it wasn't clean. You know, whenever you get a medal like that, obviously it's fresh, it's clean, it's the yep. ribbon, iron, they put it around your neck. Well, the ribbon was really wrinkled. And so as I'm looking at this thing, I'm thinking in my head, you know, he must have held it and they probably snatched it out of his hands or something. <laughs> and so they say, it's like, well, here's your gold medal. And I just looked at it and said, gosh, at least he could have ironed a ribbon for me. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> that was the first thing I said about it. But, but, what saved me on that whole deal, honestly, 
was the next day I had the long jump. Every people around me were all devastated. And I'm like, dude, I got a long jump tomorrow. Let's get let's get some smiley faces here. And 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 the multiple events saved me a lot because I just didn't have time to sit down and and fret about it. I mean, as you know, um, you played many many games where, god dang it, I want to get back and play that game again tomorrow. And that's kind of how I was. Did Ben Johnson ever apologize to you or ever say anything to you about it? Well, you know, we, we've gone over the years talking about that. And I, I think the, the big missed opportunity for Ben is that he's never really accepted it. You know, he's never accepted that this is what I did. Um, and I veered off in my life, but I got my life back together. It's always been uh, being able to try to, to, to shed and, and split on everyone else. Well, they're all doing it too, blah, blah, blah. And I think that's the thing. I, I didn't really need an apology, but I think what could have helped us, um, our relationship, and also our sport, is if he had accept the responsibility and focused on making sure that everyone else didn't do the same mistake. We take a brief time out and return for a victory lap with the great Carl Lewis here on Game Time. Game Time with Boomer Esiason is back. During his long and distinguished track career, Carl Lewis often railed against the exploitation of athletes whenever money was involved. I love this. So what about the situation today, Carl? You know, we, we live in a world that has been hit by the pandemic. Uh, we see the Black Lives Matter movement going on right now. I know your dad marched with Martin Luther King. I think your two brothers were baptized by uh, Reverend King. Uh, you have a unique perspective because you've always fought for athletes' rights, but now it seems like the athletes are fighting for an even bigger cause. Well, um, yeah, it's interesting because in the 60s, we were raised um, with that perspective and, and that thought. And, and um, now I always wondered, I said, what was it like being at that time when there was such a strong movement and you had such meaning to your lives? We're just tired of seeing these young men killed uh, and, and hearing the stories of the things that are happening. But I think what happened is the George Floyd issue was so egregious that no one could deny it. And I think that even people that had not thought about themselves, that we know, they know in their heart they're not racist or anything, but they started to see, this is just ridiculous. I cannot be just not racist. I also have to have some compassion and also um, some empathy for what they're going through. And I think that happened. And then the pandemic kept everyone home so that they could really see it. So it, it, this, is a, this is a story that's bigger than all of us. And I think it's important to understand that there's a large movement in this country that has empathy. And I'm just so proud of these young people of all colors and all backgrounds, having the empathy for people uh, that they have, they have met. Um, an interesting thing too on that is that George, I live right in the same neighborhood where George Floyd yeah. uh, grew up. Um, and it's right near the University of Houston. And so I see people every day um, uh, that were friends of his or this. And so that's why Houston has such a pride. But, but I'm really excited about the, the young people, the fight, the struggle, and how it's going into professional sports. It's going into um, business. And it's just a time where we have to have empathy for everyone as equals. And I think we're moving forward in a great way. Do your, do your young athletes know about the story about your father marching with MLK? And do they ever ask you for counsel in regards to any of the things that they may be getting themselves into these days? Well, what I try to do actually is weave in life stories into everything. I mean, in practice every day, I try to give something, um, whether it's, it's my parents meeting Dr. King or um, uh, the entertainers, because that's what really gets them. They'll see pictures on Twitter or Facebook or, or something all the time saying, gosh, you knew Tupac? Gosh, you knew Biggie? You knew all these people? <laughs> you know? yeah. And so I'll say, yeah, I did. Yeah. And then I'll pivot to, like, when we were talking about a youth program that we wanted to do and we wanted to work together with. Um, and so those are the kind of things. And then also, you know, in, in my group, obviously with sprinters, male and female, they're the vast majority are African-American. And so I, I stress the education side. And so the, one of the things I'm the most proud of as a coach at Houston was that we've had no athletes leave early. They've all stayed there four years focused on getting their degree. And that's something that I really promise to parents um, when I sit down and recruit with them. I'm not out recruiting to try to get kids to, to win and then if they leave and turn pro. I'm being honest with them in the fact that, that we're trying to, to have you successful the rest of your life. And um, I, I, I do give the kids an African-American perspective because that's the life I know and live. But I'm just glad they don't have to go through a lot of the things that I did, just like I didn't have to go through what Jesse Owens did. 
You know, Carl, you're giving a, a great message to your kids. Uh, it's great talking to you again. It's great for you to join us here on Game Time. I really do appreciate it. And thanks for everybody out there watching. You just saw the great Carl Lewis. You just heard from him. It doesn't get much better than that. I'm Boomer Esiason, and I'll see you again soon right here on Game Time with U.S. pole vault Olympic medalist Sandy Morris and Sam Kendrick. Well, Boomer, how did we get 60? <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. <clears throat> so we're the same. You're 59 now, right? We're the same age. That's right. Yeah. So we both were born in 61. Yeah. Yeah. When did this happen to us? You know, so. <laughs>